Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Happy New Year. We're back for another year of Fireside Chat. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt. Matt, how were your holidays? Oh, pretty good. Very busy. And I always like to keep busy when possible. And we had a lot of games to watch, so it'll be interesting to cover this week. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting week to talk about these Flames games. Let's jump right into it. The first game after our last uh, episode was the first Battle of Alberta for the season. This was Calgary and Edmonton playing in Edmonton. The Flames took a quick road trip there after the holiday break. And we saw the Flames really, I think, dominate this one more than we were both probably thinking that they would. Andrew Mongepani, Matthew Kachuk. Sean Monahan, Elias Lindholm, and Michael Backlund all score goals in this one, and it gives the Flames a five to one win over our re- over our provincial rivals. Were you expecting that big of a win in this one? Well, I was expecting the Flames to win just due to the fact that it is Edmonton, and frankly, Edmonton is two players and an AHL team. <laughs> so, you know it. As long as you play adequately, you should be able to win against the Oilers. And yeah, it, it didn't surprise me that they won, but they pretty much thumped them as best that any team could in this one. Yeah, I just wasn't expecting that dominating of a win. Like, I expected a win, but I didn't expect a 5 1 loss or 5 1 win for the Flames, 5 1 loss for the Oilers. And. After the uh, after the holidays, we often see the Flames not looking great in their first game back. Yeah, well, usually, like, there was that one year where the Flames got out, shut out, like, three or four times in a row right after Christmas, and, like, just, and that's typically how they play, is just absolutely awful for the first three or four games. They finally usually start getting their feet under themselves on the New Year's Eve game. Yeah, and a bit of a different story this year for sure. Um, going from that game to the next game here for the Flames, they... This is more what we were expecting. <laughs> yeah, this is. Uh, the Calgary Flames had the um, had a couple days off here to rest and recover, and on the uh, 29th, they had in Calgary the Vancouver Canucks coming to visit and almost an opposite score. We had... Uh, the Canucks beat the Flames 5-2, to two. and in this one, I really don't know what to say a lot about this one. It just looked like, yeah, Calgary was still sleeping. They looked terrible yeah. in the first. Yeah, and like this is more of what I think we were both kind of expecting from this team, but it, it's just frustrating when this the Flames, like Vancouver's not a very good team, and... Like it's like every single thing went wrong in the first period, and they just were completely flat. Yeah, you know, I was joking with some guys sitting next to me in the press box. I said, "Wow, if that's how Calgary looks in the first period, and the second is traditionally their worst period, how can it get worse than what we saw?" Yeah. Um, I you know I thought, "Wow, these guys almost wouldn't be showing up to play then." Um, yeah, well, like the. the for me, like, the one thing that I question is why the Flames didn't pull Riddick after the second Tyler Myers goal. Like, that was such a bad shot, weak wrist shot from the point, that, like, to me, it's like, yeah, you, the goalie's not in the game at all. Like, if he's letting that in, like, just get him out and put the other guy in. Because, like, his head's clearly not in the game if he's letting a goal like that in. And yet, they left him in, and a couple minutes later, he gave up another bad goal to Vertanen. And just, yeah, if just frustrating effort in the first period by Riddick. Yeah, I mean, Riddick, you know, he didn't play the whole game here. Um, no. We did see him pulled, and I think that was more about the team than David Riddick. Those weren't... They were his fault in some cases, but I think, you know, you you expect that from a young goalie. And at this point, we have to remember, Riddick's played less than 100 games in the NHL. Like, you know, there's going to be times when he doesn't look as good as he could. Yeah, for sure. And he's still learning this game. Yeah, it's just that, like, when you have a goal like that second one go in, like, that's... 
Yeah, like that. That's like reminds me of like the early '90s Sega Genesis type games where like you dump the puck in from center ice and the goalie would just muff it for some reason and it would go in. And it's like, um, okay, it, like it just, you know, it was one of those type of goals and it just, yeah, like that. You can't have goals like that being scored on you. No. Um, I some of the notes that I have here on this game, the Flames kept making stupid passes to nobody. Like, they were passing up the ice, there seemingly was nobody there, and the puck would go right on a Vancouver player's stick. Um, you know, and it's like, what what are you expecting when you're almost giving the puck to the other team? Yeah, it, it's frustrating because of the fact that, like, if the Flames had, you know, had a better start to this game, they probably would have won. It's just, it, it seems like they can't... Uh, it almost feels like, especially uh, when we're talking about the Chicago game next, it's like they take weak teams like Vancouver and like Chicago for granted that, oh, these guys suck, so we don't need to try, and like we'll just win because we're awesome. And they don't come out, and then, oh, it's 3 nothing, and oh, crap, now we have to actually try and by then it's too late yeah and and this is one where it it started looking too late and it just got to the point where you know what there's no way that these guys are going to be able to come back i mean you know by the time halfway through the second they started taking some bad penalties and that's where the frustration um mounted and then i thought they looked better in the third but by that point it yeah was just, it's too it was far, so far gone. gone yeah um, and I think really, if you look at it too, the Flames took way too many penalties and had to rely on way too few guys because of it. Guys like Manji, Penny, and Dubé suffered. They barely got any ice time because the Flames couldn't get their regular lineups going. So you're getting your guys tired there. Yeah. And it's it just a frustrating effort all the way around. And, you know, easily preventable if they had started the game on time. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're right. It's uh, it's one of those things, you know, and, and we've talked about it here. The coaches talk, talked about it. You've got to start on time, right? And if we're not starting on time, we're not going to be successful. That's the way it goes. Yeah. And now for the game that I think was the most important visually of the week. New Year's Eve, the next game on the docket. Uh, the Calgary Flames hosted the Blackhawks and ended up losing 5-3 of the Blackhawks. And I thought once again... Um, started the game just as bad as the Vancouver game. We saw three goals against the Flames in the first period, and I think once again, after that, there's no recovering. Yeah, and they went down 4 nothing. Made a game of it at least 4-3, but yeah, it, 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 that by far too late. Um, this game it should be one that the Flames coaching staff shows Johnny Gaudreau every practice and every video session isolate Patrick Kane in this game and if you want because I was watching him a lot in this game because he was noticeable for one but they're very comparable types of players and Kane was relentless on each shift and doing all of the little things and giving a good effort and making sure that he was doing the things that he needed to do to be successful. And then you see Gaudreau, who on occasion does an interesting thing or two, but like there's no effort or drive from Gaudreau to do any of the little things correctly. And that's what separates the Flames from what the Blackhawks were, and Gaudreau as a player from Patrick Kane, because ta talent-wise, they're very comparable players. But, you know, it, effort level is just clearly, you know, G Kane is the real deal, and Gaudreau has not been anywhere near that this season. And he needs to, like, I'd be focusing in on this, as a teaching tool to him to try and get him to play the game the right way because he has the talent and skill in him to be that level of guy 
it's just for whatever reason the effort level is just not there yeah and it's i mean it's more this year than what we've seen in the past right i mean we've seen that effort level there in the past and we you and i don't know and we could speculate forever but why is the effort not there this year yeah and it, it's just frustrating to see because of the fact that and like and it, this is a universal thing to the flames thus far this season it, the talent is there like they they didn't get 107 points last year by fluke they're a good team it's just that for whatever reason the effort levels to getting into the tough areas is not there and it's like none of the players are willing to sacrifice the body at all to get into the tough areas to generate the scoring chances and yet you see guys like Kane and Taves you know and they're not anywhere near as good as they were when the the Hawks were winning the cups but the effort level was there and it looked like the cup winning caliber team that we saw in the early part of the last decade and it's just frustrating because of the fact that like when I'm overly optimistic with this team, it's because I see the talent there and the frustration comes from the fact that, yeah, the talent's there, but the give a crap meter is at zero at, with this team. And it seems like everybody's just playing for a paycheck, you know, and not doing the things that are actually needed to win. And it's frustrating to see because they're, they are squandering an opportunity because our division is quite terrible. Yeah, no, that's that's true. And it's games like this when you look at them. And, you know, I mean, this team's really been a win-one-lose-one team all year. And you look at games like this, they had the opportunity to win this. And if the Flames would have played well and had that consistency that you need to be even a playoff team, um, you know, they should have had no problem with the Hawks. Yeah, and... Like, and it's frustrating, like, when this team, like, in the last, like, 10 minutes of a game will turn it on and actually show the willingness to come back. And, like, they did score two goals in the last five minutes and really pushed and came close a couple of times in the last two minutes to tying the game. But if you had any consistency with doing even some of those things during the the course of a game you would get up naturally just because of the fact that you're putting yourself in prime opportunities to score and you wouldn't need that last minute desperation and it's just frustrating to see because they have it there like if they didn't have it there those last minute pushes to come back when they're down by three or four goals like we've seen on multiple occasions this year would just not be there they'd get blown out seven to nothing or whatever and who cares but like the i remember the halloween game where they were down four nothing after two periods and won that game and like the talent is there it's just it's well, frustrating he, and in this one i mean i thought the flame started to push back okay in the second um, you know, they had some good chances, I thought, but Leonard was giving up some big rebounds and they just weren't there to pick up those rebounds and stuff like yeah, that. Like, uh, yeah, like, you can't win the, if you're not in position. Exactly. And like, if they had sacrificed the body a little bit from getting the odd slash here and there to get into those tough areas, the Flames might have even came back and won that in regulation. But they didn't until it was too late and they got burned by it and it, it's just frustrating because like this team has it and yet they're not willing to do what's necessary to actually take advantage of it and i don't know and i don't want to speculate on what the issue might be because you and i don't really have that insight but they i mean even if you look at a best of seven playoff series right these guys need to be better like you can't you, you can't be winning one and losing one if you're going to even make it past the first round. No, and, like, honestly, if the Flames, like, with this kind of effort level, like, we've seen this since Christmas, like, if the, the Flames do make the playoffs, which, frankly, they should just do the fact that the division is horrible, you know, 
that would be the team, like, if I'm looking unbiasedly on the 1 through 8, that would be the team that I'm hoping to draw, is the Flames, because that, that's going to be a 4 or 5 game series. Oh, for and, sure. And, because they're not going to try too hard, and, you know, because they don't have it in them, it seems, like we saw last year in the playoffs. And, it, like, it's just really frustrating because they have the talent, and that's... Like, it'd be different if they, you know, it was like the end of the Aginla era part portion of the Flames where they had, like, three guys on the team, and, you know, like it, you had guys like Blake Como on the second line. Like, yeah, you're not really going to do much no matter what you do. But, like, this team has most of what you need and yet the effort level's not there and that's the frustrating part yeah I, I really don't know what to say there um it's it's definitely a frustrating frustrating start for the flames and you know this whole season has been a frustrating start and we'll see what happens here um i did want to know good game for bennett he stayed out of the box he got a goal i think you know that's pretty much all we can ask for a depth guy like him yeah, he's ever since he's returned from injury, he's played noticeably better than he has previously, and hopefully that ca carries on moving forward, and he can start, you know, maybe building some value. And like it, in the last game, he was playing uh, on with Kachuk at some point, and looked very good during that game. So hopefully he can earn more ice time and maybe become that top six forward that he should be. What We have seen flashes of it. It's just, yeah. Should we move on to the next one? Yep. Um, the Calgary Flames open 2020 with a game at home against the New York Rangers. Team we don't see a whole lot of here. This is their once-a-year stop. And Calgary ended up winning this one. A 4-3 win for the Flames. Uh, we got goals here from Goudreau, Backlund, Ryan, and Monaghan. So I guess our, you know, two, two-thirds of our first line. And um, Backlund, oh, and Ryan, yeah. So Goudreau, Backlund, Ryan, and Monaghan. It's two-thirds of our first line. Or, you know, what used to be our first line, I guess, depending on what game. And some depth scoring, too. But I thought this was, again, a weird game for the Flames. They went from a very poor game against the Hawks to what I thought was a better game. It it seemed like both teams in this one and let me know if what you think that like neither team could finish. Like they'd get most of the way to like a really good scoring chance and then it just like it just seemed like you're expecting the goal to come and like even though they there was seven goals in the game like it just seemed like both teams were kind of having a hard time getting over the hump. Yeah, yeah, I can see where you're coming from with that one. Neither team looked great. This wasn't a great Calgary Flames game. Yeah. Um but it, it was you know It certainly could have been a uh, like an either way kind of game like it was just who capitalized on their chances better and calgary came out ahead on that one but it just seemed like both sides had some really dynamite setups and it just no like the goalies both i think played fairly decently it just you know it was not the best effort defensively, I think, for either team. No, and I think Calgary, you know, they did get the win, but you can't argue in this one that either team probably should have won, I don't think. Yeah. But, you know... Because, like, if you, were, if you reverse the score, it'd be like, yeah, that makes sense. Exactly. I think, like you said, both teams had some lapses in this one. Neither team really played all that well. But, you know, someone's got to win every game, the way the NHL's set up. And in this one... The Flames, I think, I don't want to say they got lucky, but they got lucky to win this. Yeah. And once again, kind of playing down to their opponent's level because the Rangers aren't very good. Yeah. But, you know, it happens. And Adam Fox, you know, he had three assists and boo, but, you know, that's all I have to say on that. <laughs> well, the next game here, probably the weirdest game of this whole set, if not one of the weirdest games all season. Uh, January 5th on Sunday, the Flames took on the Wild, and 
Nobody could really hold a lead here. The Wild scored, the Flame scored. 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 It was pretty much a back and forth game. The Flames ended up winning 5 to 4 in 7 rounds of overtime. Um, but you know, again, I didn't think a, these are generally two teams you don't see a lot of offense from. So a weird game from these guys to get 9 goals when you usually get a one nothing game or a 2 to 1 game. Um, it, this one should have been a clear Flames regulation victory, but David Riddick was awful in the first period, I think. And frankly, like all three of the goals that he surrendered in the first period should not have went in. And if you had an average goaltender, I think that the Flames enter the first intermission to nothing. This was Riddick's it, 100th game, just as a, a matter of point. Yeah, and... Does it look like Riddick's getting tired to you? Like, does it look like he's just played too much I, hockey? Yeah, like, he's not focused in the net as much, and he's letting in a lot of chintzy goals. Like, there was that one that uh, leaked through him on the power play that it's like, under normal circumstances, that's a routine save. And yet, it it's just like the Tyre Myers goal in the Vancouver game, the second one, where it's like if you're focused at all, that's a, clearly an easy save. But you're not set properly, and oh, it, it's a goal for the other team. And Riddick did play better as the game went on, and especially in the shootout, he's the reason why the Flames won. But on the overall, I think that we need to start seeing more of Cam Talbot in that, at least for the near-ish future, because it just does look like Riddick's getting too many games and is just looking a little sloppy. Yeah, sloppy, yeah, I can kind of see that. Um, I I think that, yeah, he's just, to me, he's looking tired. I think tired leads to mistakes for anybody, right? So I think that it's... Um, you know, it's just a case, like you said, we got to see more of Talbot. I think we need to sit Riddick down for a bit. And as you and I have said many times, we need that time to, um, to sit down to, as a team, I think, look at both goalies and say, are they both playing to their potential? And if one isn't, what do we have to do? If they think Talbot's not the guy, I think he's capable of being a, you know, playing three, four games in a row and giving the team a good show. But if they don't think he is a team, why not? And what can they do about it? Yeah, and I think Talbot should be given that opportunity, just in the similar manner that Chad Johnson was a couple years ago, and let him see if he can take the ball and run with it. And if not, then you just you're giving Riddick a bit of a breather anyway, which will help when he gets back in. But yeah, it's. Just uh, what like what we've been seeing from the two goalies this year remind gives me flashbacks to like Jonas Hiller and Kari Ramo. I don't you know, know if where, I go that far. Not the second year where like Hiller was letting everything in, but like the first year where they were kind of just both mediocre and there. Yeah, like, I don't it, think we can say that Riddick's been mediocre, but he definitely needs a rest. Yeah. Well, certainly lately, Riddick has been mediocre since about the middle of December. But, I mean, when Brad brought, brought both these goalies in, by Brad, I'm speaking GM Brad for living, he kind of said, you know, they're paying them equally. They're looking for one of them to be the starter. And I think they came in looking at Riddick at the start of the season. But would you agree that, you know, Talbot is a capable starter? Yeah. It, he's not going to blow you away, but... He's an above average starter. You know, if you look at my some mind. of the backups we've had on this team in previous years, he's a lot better than other options. I don't think he's your starter all season, but I think no, he's, he's a guy probably you can lean on for two weeks. Yeah, to me, he's probably the single best backup we've had since even before Kipper. Like when we had Turk as the backup in 03 04. Like it, because frankly, most of our backups have kind of been terrible, but. Uh, he just does a responsible job. He throws up his has a nine thirteen save percentage, which is decent. You know his goals against is a little high, but the Flames have also been allowing a lot of shots because they've not played very well at times when he's in net. But you know it, 
it's one of those where I think that the Flames just need to try and light a fire, you know, get the goaltending better. Because, frankly, I think the Flames win four, maybe five of the games this week if the goaltending was better than what it was. But, uh, and, like, especially in that Vancouver game, like, if Talbot started that game, I think the Flames win that one outright. But, you know, it it is what it is, and I think that the Flames just need to try and improve in that area as well. Like, it seems like the entire team has, like, everything going slightly wrong. <laughs> well, and it hasn't just been lately either. It's been all season. Yeah, and it's just weird. Like, it's almost like uh, with the San Jose Sharks, um seeing like how they're having like most of their good players all struggle in the same manner all season and and you know they went from being just as good as the flames were to pretty much dead last in the west you know we talked about earlier in the season that this team the calgary flames tends to go year in year out with the playoffs recently so i mean last year was a playoff year that means this year's not going to be knock on wood I hope that's not true, but it just, it seems like they can't put consistent seasons together for whatever reason. Yeah, and, like, it's not necessarily a bad thing if the Flames decide to, like, retool a bit and, like, shift out certain parts and, like, move forward with other things and, you know, because, like, if you were going to sell things at this deadline... Like, with how, like, the contract situation is done up for the Flames, like, this is actually a fairly good time to, if you're going to shake things up. It's just, you know, you, on the other hand, you don't want to miss the, the playoffs outright because, like, that sucks. Yeah, so. I, I don't think you can really make many moves if you're this team that way until the deadline when you have... Oh, for sure. Idea. And even then, they might just hold Pat in case they make it and sell it the, at the draft. Yeah, well, like, that's where, like, like if the Flames are, say, like, they're ninth currently, if they're, say, 10th or 11th in the week or so prior to the dre- deadline, like, I'm hoping that, like, all the UFAs are gone, and to be, and maybe even, like, a more significant piece, like a Michael Backlund, and, you know, like, shake a lot of things up, and, you know, move on and try to change the like do like a mini rebuild on the fly a retool yeah you, like i'm you not mentioned that to us before yeah because like this team really is frustrating this uh <laughs> minnesota trip was the start of the team's annual dad's trip so i guess you could say that these boys did better with adult supervision yeah that definitely seems to be the and case. And we'll see if that carries on when they're in Chicago on Tuesday night again with their dads. Yeah. Um, an, an interesting note on that uh, Minnesota game, the Flames went back to, I guess, what we could call their regular lines. We saw Johnny, Monty, and Elias put together again. Um, we can't say that we saw the 3M line because one-third of 3M line is not there, but some more familiar-looking lines, I guess. Well, it's always good to try new things because you never know when chemistry is going to work for you. Because um, you might find that, like, say, Froli- or, um, Gaudreau and, say, Lucic might have found a bond together and that was dynamic. You don't know until you try it. It didn't work. So you go back to what used to work and hope that it does. We talked about one-third of the 3M line not being here, and I think that's probably the biggest story this week. The Flames made their first trade. I think we were waiting for something to happen in the first trade of this season in moving Michael Froelich out of here. Um, You and I had talked in the past, and I said, really, I think for the Flames to do anything, they're going to need to move Froelich for pennies on the dollar in order to free up some cap room, and I think that's what we saw here. Froelich got traded to the Buffalo Sabres, and uh, in exchange, we got a fourth round pick that was San Jose's until just moments for the pit, the trade. We won't necessarily get into why or how that happened on their end, but getting a fourth round pick for Fro Leak, which really just frees up about four and a half million in cap room. Yeah, if I recall, that San Jose pick went to Ottawa, then to Montreal, then to Buffalo, and then to us. So. Will it stay with us? That's the question. 
Yeah. Well, with San Jose being terrible, hey, it's almost like a third rounder. So, so always looking at the positive there. So your prediction for first flame traded this year was for leak, and now it's been done. I think we're all kind of waiting for this to happen. Uh, GM Brad Treliving said after the deal that he made the move and he intends to use the cap room that he gained from it, which tells you something's going to happen. They're looking to bring somebody in somewhere. Um, why don't we talk a little bit about that trade market before we do for leak. He was a good flame for the last couple of years. I mean, we've had a knock on him, but this guy has been playing really on the flame second line for how long, right? And well, the first couple of years that he was here, like he was pretty much a perfect UFA signing. And it wasn't until pretty much the middle of last year uh, through like he, him getting traded that he was kind of, not nearly as good and effective and to me like that was probably Treliving's best free agent signing and I, I have nothing at all to complain about with what he did in the Flames jersey he was a very serviceable player and you know I wish him all the best in Buffalo yeah I think he'll work well in Buffalo he's an expiring deal and I think he, you know he'll probably have a job in the NHL next year but not at nearly the salary he's making now so you know the Flames don't seem to be missing him either I think this is one of those things where Dylan Dubé who started the season in Stockton has really pushed his way onto the team and made the Flames have to make a move somewhere yeah well you look at like Tobias Reeder to me basically does everything that for leak is doing it, it, he was simply just expendable and you know it it is what it is you know like it is a business after all and you know i'm glad that he'll be getting more of an opportunity to play in buffalo especially because the, their right wing situation has been riddled with injuries lately so he'll he'll definitely get a lot of ice time but it's one of those situations where the Flames have too many options for a good third, fourth line type, and his time just came. Yeah, and, you know, like you said, uh, Reader's one of those guys. The Flames have kept Ronaldo up here. We've even seen, you know, um, Zarnik go down to the, to the Stockton Heat as a way to keep guys up here. Like, I think we've seen... As much as it's a poor season for a lot of players, guys like Mangiapane, Dubé, even Reader, I think, have quite an emergence this year. Yeah, and that's what you need to see. And like we, even on the back end, you've seen Anderson take off, and he's looking more like a higher quality, like top number three or better defenseman. And it's good. It's just that the flight, like that's why, like I, I'm not really opposed to the Flames. Like, if things go sideways-ish and, like, they're still waffling between now and the deadline, that I wouldn't mind this team going on a full shakeup just because of the fact that you have so many good young players coming up through the organization and you'll be also freeing up cap space, you know, to reinvest at during free agency. And, like, you can go and, say, sign that, flashy free agent like taylor hall and not really damage your team in terms of oh well now we don't have any depth because we do have those high quality depth pieces coming up through the organization and we even have other guys like glenn godin that are pushing up from stockton and matthew phillips that are going to start needing some ice time in the nhl soon enough yeah, no, you're you're totally right there. There's a lot of guys. God and Phillips, even oh, I shouldn't say a lot of guys. A few guys. Um, God and yeah. Phillips, I think, are the two major guys who they like to bring up and find a spot for. So, you know, as much as Froelich has been a good soldier, if you're in the current cap climate, if you're not cap friendly, teams are going to find a way to move you. Yeah, and like that's why, say like a guy like Michael Backlund, you know. It, the, the writing starts to get on the wall, you know, of can you use his $5 million better elsewhere? And, and, and especially if the Flames are looking at Elias Lindholm as a center. I mean, you've got, let's say, Monaghan and Lindholm as your top two centers. 
Backlund's a third line center at five point three million is a lot of money to pay a third line center. Yeah, and then you have Derek Ryan who easily takes a third line center spot, like you, without any issue at all. And you have the fourth line where you can throw Dubé or Jankowski or you know Godin, insert name of random fourth line guy who cares, and you know you're perfectly fine with being able to do it that way and it's become you know and backland is a very serviceable asset and you know like the flames could get a first plus for him because everybody needs a decent middle six center and you know they, they don't grow on trees but thankfully the flames do like if they do want to change the culture of the team around you know, you could do that and then reinvest the five million and change elsewhere in the off season. Yep. Yeah, you're you're right there. Well, let's talk a little bit more about um, where they might spend some money and what they might do. And we're just over a month away from the trade deadline. The Calgary Flames, um, well, not just the Flames, every team has a deadline for trades of February twenty fourth. So. Um, month let's call it a month and three weeks away brad trelivany has already come out and said in an interview that he is not interested in any rentals for this team he freed up some cap space to, but doesn't want to just go out and get a high priced rental we know brad likes his his defensive rentals we've seen that the last couple of years even some depth rentals that's why i don't know if we're going to hold on to this fourth that we got but um, it sounds like the Flames want to spend that cap that they have on a guy with terms. So, Matt, I've put together three names here, two that maybe are desirable, one that's not. Let's talk about these guys, and then you can throw any other names in there you're looking for. Okay. Um, a name that's come out, a guy who's probably going to get traded, is Chris Kreider, or Kreider out, of New, out of the New York Rangers. Um, rumor is that he's all but out of the Big Apple. What would you think of the Flames making a shot at him? I've always liked Crater, uh, just because of the fact that he is an annoying, annoying, annoying pain in the ass to play against. He's very much, uh, uh, has the similar demeanor as Matthew Kachuk, where he irritates the goaltenders, he pushes and he shoves, and he can score. So, you know, it, it would definitely fit in with the culture of the team, and you know he would probably be my number one trade target just because of the fact that he fits that guy with an edge who can actually play what would you be willing to give up for him that's the 64 million dollar question though and the problem that i have is it's still too early to tell what this team is because, like, frankly, I don't want this team to spend assets at the trade deadline at all if we're 7th or 8th or less. Like, it's, like, well, okay, yeah, you got to the playoffs and we get to see four games. Woo. Like, if this kind of stuff is not changing with this team where, like, they're going on a long, protracted roll between now and the trade deadline and especially because of the fact that the flame schedule is extremely light between now and then they should be able to but if they're not then do you want to add and like like a, under normal circumstances something like a first for Kreider wouldn't be out of line but i certainly wouldn't want to do that if the flames are you know, on the verge of being a lottery team. And Kreider's in the last year of his contract. So as much as our GM said, um, you know, he doesn't want to do rentals, I think he would want assurances he could sign this player first. And in that case, like you said, if we're not thinking we're going to go deep, maybe we're better to not give him an asset and kick some tires on the 1st of July when he's a free agent. Exactly. And, like, he's he has 26 points. He's basically on pace for his normal 50-ish points. And... You know, that's definitely acceptable. It's just that, you know, do you want to spend those assets now? And, you know, it would definitely be doable. Like, he's a six foot three, 217 pound left winger. 
you know, that would help. It's just, you know, it, the timing. It, and I'm like, I, I'm kind of leery, like, at, at this point, just because of the fact, like, how they've played this past week, where it's, they've had five easy opponents, and they've looked bad they for the most Flames of... The Rangers. The Flames. Uh, and the... Flames have looked poor in four of the five games, even though their opponents have all been kind of on the mediocre to bad side. And, you know, you begin to wonder of whether this team is actually worth investing anything in, in terms of, you know, spending assets to improve this current iteration, and if it's not just a better idea outright to just wait and like see if you can't shuffle the deck chairs a bit during the draft and the offseason well, the downside to to Kreider is that he's a left shot and this team has enough left shots we really need a right shot so you know i think unless the flames had a guy they really felt they needed to move of similar money um i i don't I think you might see him here after July 1st, but I don't think they're going to go out and spend an asset. I also think that he's probably one of the most sought-after rentals, so I think that we're probably going to get priced out of the market. Yeah. Like, I'd expect, like, a St. Louis or a Colorado more so to be his destination. Yeah, I would agree. Um, another name out of Ottawa, a guy who's also on an expiring contract, but is a right shot... Jean Gabriel Pajot. He's an alternate alternate captain with the Senators this year. A guy who, you know, probably a good player, not playing on a great team, but I can see wanting to get out of there as soon as he can. If not at the uh, deadline, I'm sure he'll be out of there this summer. What would you think about going after Pajot? I've always liked Pajot, but in some ways it'd be a little redundant just due to the fact that he's another small winger and he he's basically um he's a better version of Manjapani or Dubé but not even overly so and like he's been pretty much a 30 point guy for his career up until this season he has 30 points but you know when Ottawa's you know, as bad as they are, he's getting premium ice time where he was more of a second, third, fourth line guy in years gone by. I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect the Flames to. He, how would you say he? He seems to be one of those where he would be a high sale price at the deadline for an underwhelming return for the player that you're getting and like I could see him getting upwards of a first from some team and then them going oh he's like a second third line guy not a first line guy there's always going to be some bubble team um, I could see actually Edmonton going after him but there's going to be some bubble team that just wants to stock up yeah and is willing to mortgage uh, their future to do it and we said every year somebody gives away all their picks doesn't get as far as they want and then goes crap now we got nothing yeah, and I think that Pajot would be pretty much like the poster child. If we're talking the off season, he's one of the ones that is on my list of hey, kick the tires on that. And like if the Flames threw four and, and a bit million at him, sure, yeah, like gave him for a leaks contract, I'd be like, yeah, sure, that, I think that if works. The Flames could assure that he was going to sign here for a reasonable deal i'd be okay to maybe go out and look at him but i don't think you bring him in as a rental yeah i wouldn't go more than a second on pajot and i think he'll go for more than that the next name here is maybe the one that's... and that would and that would be a signed pajot not a you know yeah rental. i don't think the flames can go free agent shopping if you will for any of these guys um you know i don't think they're at a place where we can be confident we're going deep in the playoffs so I, I really don't think you can go you can go out and you know really get any guy like that if you don't have him signed. Mm -hmm. The next one will be tough to fit under the salary cap and maybe not desirable, but I know that Nashville is going to be trying to move the contract. What would you think about going after the six million dollar a year Kyle Turris? If Nashville eats a good portion of it, it might not be the worst idea. How much would you want them to eat of the six? 
If you could get them to eat two million and make it a four million dollar contract, three. half. Of yeah, that. well, uh, yeah, well, that would be ideal, but that'd probably cost you a lot in terms of assets going the other way. Uh, He's thirty. He has four years left on the deal at six million. I think. You know, even then, later down the road, you're going to run into some issues with fitting a 33, 34 year old player under cap. Yeah, this would only make sense if you're able to flip Michael Backlund. Like, he's a center, and you know, like if you made a trade where you're shuffling deck chairs, where you're moving Backlund out and bringing Turris in on a cheap return. See, I don't even. Yeah. I think even Backlund has more value to the team. I'm almost thinking to have to move like Jankowski and, you know, get get them to do you a favor and eat some of the uh, Jankowski and something, and then get them to oh, eat yeah. some of that deal. Oh, I'm not. I'm not saying trade Backlund to Nashville in this deal. I'm saying like, say like trade Backlund to you know, insert contender team here, and. You, for like a first plus and then buy low on Taurus. Well, I think Jankowski is buying low. Yeah, and that, that would be about right. Maybe throw in a lesser depth piece as well. But yeah, I could see that working. You know, and I think you're doing that team a favor by taking them off their hands. Again, he's a right shot guy. He's got some experience. I don't necessarily want him here, but I could see these two teams doing business. Yeah, if the price is right, you know, because Turris isn't a bad player. Turris just isn't a $6 million player. Yeah, and like it, him at $4 million, it's like, yeah, that's fine. Well, I mean, if we look on our lineup, Goudreau's 6.75, so with that in mind, there's no way that Turris is 6. Monaghan's 6.3, yeah. there's no way Turris is 6. Backlund's 5.3, no way Turris is 6. Even Lindholm's 4.8. No way Turris is six. But if you compare Turris to Lucic, Lucic we're paying 5.25. Yeah, okay, maybe if we can get him at four, you've got some there. Yeah, and he would be a serviceable player at $4 million. Like, I could see that working. You know, I wouldn't expect the Flames to have to kick in much in terms of the acquisition cost. It might be like Jankowski plus, like, the Sharks fourth. You know, like that, yeah, that I, would I be think about. You usually see with those kind of older guys that the pick becomes conditional. You know, it'd probably be if he scores so many goals or plays so many games um, with the Flames. Yeah. But I can't see them just giving a pick outright. I think it would be something conditional. Yeah. And, you know, he's not a bad player. And, like, this is where, like, if you're wanting to change the culture of the team a bit. You know, swapping out parts that, like, have been here just for, you know, comparable different parts. You know, a backland for tourist swap, that's fine. You know, like, there's no real, like, you're not really losing anything in terms of overall talent in that move. It's just, you know, it's a different person. And, you know... It, you would be able to get more assets, though, for Backland. Well, that's why I, I wouldn't want to move Backland for Torres. I think Backland has no. better value. Yeah, like, that would be where, like, you trade Backland to St. Louis or Colorado or Boston or Washington or something like that, like one of the truly elite teams, because lo those teams love guys like Backland in their roster, and, you know, you can... And then you get, get whatever, probably some picks or prospects, and then you backfill your saying by moving someone like Jankowski for Turris. Yeah. Yeah. Sort I, of like a three way trade. Yeah. Again, I'm not I'm not thrilled on him coming. I don't think we need Turris. I wouldn't want to spend a no. lot on him, but I think if the price is right, if you can get them to keep to eat two or three million, it might be worth looking at. Yeah. It, go bargain hunting. And, you know, you're, you'd be switching things up a little bit. And he is a right shot. So, you know, you could, if you need to, throw him as a right winger. That's and, what I would do with him. I think we have enough centers. Yeah, like, you could throw him as a center if you need to. Or, you know, it's sort of like Lindholm where you can throw him on either and shake it up. And, 
you know, he might just need a change of scenery. Like, he was a fairly good player when he was with Ottawa. He had s seasons with 55 and 64 points, 51 in his first year with Nashville. Like, he's been a fairly decent contributor. He's even at a 41-point pace over 82 games this year. Like, that's not anything to shake a stick at, especially Nashville being kind of a poor offensive team. So, you know, if the Flames could get him for a song, I don't see that being a problem. Anybody else you'd like to see this team uh, put on their radar come close to the deadline? Well, the problem is that, like, a lot of the guys that are interesting, like Paul Murray and Toffoli and that, they're going to cost too much. Well, I, I almost think if I'm Brad, I let the market sort of play its way out. Go for breakfast deadline day, let all the big names go, then come into the office and say who's left. Let's make some deals. Yeah. Yeah, like, to me... And any like, of the guys the that are rentals, we can probably yeah. take a shot at July 1. I don't think we need a rental right now. Yeah. Like, I with the emergence of guys like uh, Manjapane and Dubé and Bennett even playing better recently, like, in terms of the top nine forwards, uh, you know, like, you could always use a guy like Taylor Hall, but, you know, uh, you don't really need to go all out on one. And, like, there's always some guy that's traded on the deadline for, like, a third or a fourth round pick that's a decent, like, top nine forward that'll chip in a little bit of offense. Go for one of them. If, you, you know, because, like, I'm kind of leery still with this team of spending beyond a nominal amount. Like, I really don't want to see them trade their first or their second this year no. at all. And I think my thing is we need some picks. We need some picks in our system, whether ours or somebody else's. I don't know that going out and getting a rental, and I think we could only afford one big rental. I mean, I'm not talking to a guy like Fattenberg or, you know, Chris Stewart or those kind of guys, but one big rental. I don't know that one big rental changes this team's fortunes. So if they're no. not going to change your fortunes, is it worth doing? Yeah. And, like, if they can find, like, the odd one guy for cheap that – might chip in a little bit awesome but you know it, it's one of those where i think that the flames have to get creative and like something like the tourist trade would be something that's more on the creative side of things i just know that nashville has been rumored to want to get rid of tourists and i think even if you'd take them at a discount you'd be doing them a favor yeah and that's fine it would also i hate to say it it would give us a veteran in tourists to expose to seattle yeah, and that also helps. You know, if they want to take him, great, you can have him. Yeah. Um, well, it's just like Milan Lucic. I don't expect him to spend his last season in Calgary on his contract. I think once July 1st happens uh, and that bonus is paid out, the last, maybe even the last two seasons of his contract, I, you know, you could... There are some teams out there that'd be like, oh, well, I only have to pay like $6 million and I get like $11 million of cap relief. Yay, hey, you know, that's awesome. Yeah, I just don't want to see us. I mean, we're in cap troubles right now, partly because we are we have a lot of buyouts. So I'd rather they not buy out other guys because I think that's... No, I, I mean like dealing Lucic at no. that point for like trading him to like insert bottom feeder Find who wants a team to, who hit needs the, to hit the floor. Yeah. Yeah, I'm just I'm looking at the teams that are probably out of it this year. Nashville, Chicago, San Jose, Anaheim, LA, Detroit, New Jersey, Ottawa, the Rangers, maybe Montreal. Like I think all the good players on those teams are going to be traded for high value and I don't really want to play in those sweepstakes. I would much rather say, you know what, this core is either going to do it or not do it. And, you know, either way, we'll we'll see what this core gives us and we can make some changes at the draft or in the summer. Yeah, and like that's why I'm all for if this the Flames want to go into seller mode even and like start, you know, like the UFA defenseman Brody and Hamnick, Talbot if anybody wants them, you know. I, like, I think by yeah. the deadline there will be some team, and I said this about Gillies um, over the holidays when we chatted with uh, Jeff Gregory, Stockton's finest. I think there'll be some team in the deadline who isn't quite sure their backup and might be willing to take Gillies on as a, you know what, he's probably good enough. Let's hope we don't have to use him. 
Yeah. And I could see that with Talbot as well. A 2.75. You know what? Our backups hurt. Here's a guy who's played a lot in this league. Let's take him on. Yeah. And I'm sure that there's a handful of teams that wouldn't mind a guy like Talbot as a backup. So, like, if the Flames... Like, frankly, unless the Flames are, like, right there with Vegas by the deadline, I frankly, I'm more leaning into let's, you know, strip some of the team apart and go into the offseason with a, a list of, well, we need to get this defenseman or that defenseman or, you know, this part and, you know, go into UFA and sign those parts i think right now i would move one of hannafin or brody i think you got to keep one move one but this team also wants to make room for valamaki next year so i think they really need to decide which of those two pieces do you keep yeah well that's why like if you're wanting to you know just basically shut down for the season and you know like if the flames are out of it then you might as well cash in both of those and get yeah, as many draft picks as possible. I just don't think they'll be that far out of it. I know. Well, Valimaki should be back by then as well. Yeah, I think playing, he got some to so. Stock- I don't think he plays up here this year at least much. I think he's got to go to Stockton. He, he hasn't played at all this season. Oh, I know. But again, if you're out of it or close to I being mean, out of it, does it make guys, any you, difference? You bring Davidson up. Yeah. Right? He becomes your, your extra defenseman. Um, yeah. But, yeah, you're right. I mean, if this team has slim playoff hopes, sell both of them. Sell, you know, anyone who's not bolted down to a contract. But I don't think they're going to be that way. So I think it's going to be, you know, which one of those defensemen do we move? Yeah. We'll see. Like, it, that's the problem with this team. Like, even though it's only like a month and a half away, it's still too early to tell what exactly this team is. And what I don't want to see, though, is I don't want to see this team thinking they're better than they are, not making any move, and losing out on value. And every year yeah, there's one team that does here. that. And Calgary's been that team in the past, I think, where they haven't made a oh, deal. Oh, I know. And, like, that's the why, like, I'm kind of leaning more in the sell mode is the fact that, like, the Flames farm system consists right now of Matthew Phillips and Glenn Gaudin and a whole bunch of... Um, maybe at some point you know like like say Peltier he might become a good NHL player but we're still three years away at least for that and like the Flames just have nothing coming up at all and like Dubé and Mangiapane have graduated so like it's very slim pickings and the team really does need to start backfilling a little bit and get some prospects in here because like we're gonna come into a real major problem soon if we don't have anything coming up here's a crazy crazy question for you matt if we're out of it or pretty sure we're out of it do you move 13 at the deadline deals right sure i think there'd be a lot of teams that pay a lot for them at the deadline we know deadline pricing is like yeah if the price is right sure like to me the only players amongst the forward group that are not tradable are Monahan because he's a center more than anything um Kachuk Lindholm and the kids and that's it like anybody else frankly if you want them sure what would the right price for Goudreau be for you if they were to sell him off of the deadline or let's say over the summer either one I think if this team doesn't make the playoffs Goudreau has gone in the summer yeah, I do too. Um, I would, you know, you look at like uh, the Mike Richards deal to LA where they got Braden Shen and uh, Wayne Simmons and a draft pick. I think something along that lines where you're getting two top prospects plus a high quality draft pick or like multiple firsts and like a whole bevy of prospects. To me, I don't think if you're going to move Goudreau, you need to move him for NHL players. I think this is a trade where you want two or three first-rounders back and maybe a prospect. Like you, As you mentioned, we have a lot of young forwards. I think we have a lot of forwards already in the lineup. I think you can fix your forward problems potentially through UFA this year. So if it were me, I'd want to be restocking those cupboards. Yeah, like hypothetically at the deadline, say you get two first-plus uh 
a bunch of miscellaneous two, young two prospects. Two firsts and a, and a top-tier prospect. Yeah. Then what you do is that you go to July 1st and you say, Hey, Taylor Hall, uh, here's $10 million for seven seasons. You know. And well, and that's what I kind of meant by fixing those problems. I think with Hall or Creter or even a guy like uh, Peugeot, there's other free agents available. I think there's going to be enough guys out there that if we want to trade Johnny or we think that if we're in a point where we feel like we can trade Johnny, we're obviously in a point where we're out of it. And I think there's enough free agents that you could fill those spots without having to trade for them. So, yeah, I think at yeah. this point it's Johnny for futures. Yeah, and... We'll see. Like, uh, I don't know exactly why this team has gone from being so good to being so bad, yet, you know, like, there hasn't really been any real reason for it. It's not like we have 15 injuries or something stupid like that. It's just, yeah, something's got to change. And, like, uh, I'm hoping that over the next couple of weeks, the Flame, because they are playing mostly lousy teams that they sh- just walk all over these teams and get on a roll but you know we've been kind of saying that for a month and a half and <laughs> so let's let's just play this out here let's say they trade Goudreau either at the tra- free or the trade deadline or at the draft you now have Kachuk as your number one center or your number one left winger yeah so just for the sake of argument your first line is now Kachuk Monahan, Lindholm yeah Here's some of the free agents that are available, some of the top-end guys, let's say, the guys that you know we would probably go after if we're going to do that. Tell me if any of these names would be somebody that you think, yeah, okay, we could bring this guy in to possibly supplant what we lost with Goudreau. Uh, Backstrom. Yeah, I I think he stays, though. Um, but, yeah, that, w- that would be an interesting fit. Taylor Hall, who six. we talked about? Yeah, Hall... Hall, to me, I expect him to be in the lineup next year for the Flames. I think that it's a mutual, like, he, he's from Calgary, grew up a Flames fan. The Flames, you know, would be interested in him. They almost acquired him. They just wanted to talk Turkey on contract. That's the only reason why he's not here. And New Jersey said no. So I think that, like, when he hits UFA, I think that he'll be signing here and I, regardless. And I would be, I don't necessarily think they're the same player, but if we were replacing Goudreau with some picks and Hall, I'd be okay with that. Yeah, same here. What about Mikael Granlund? Uh, he's all right. He, he's a serviceable second, third line guy. But not bad. Um,. Mike Hoffman, older guy. I'd take him. Decent secondary scorer. Wayne He'd Simmons. No. If Tyler Toffoli makes it to the UFA market, would you take him? Sure, why not? Uh, Evgeny Dadinov. He's okay. Uh, I, yeah, sure, but if there's no other options. What about Nemesnikov? I like him. I. He'd be a decent second, third line guy. So I think, you know, if you can replace, let's say, let's just say Goudreau with Hall and Nemesnikov for all intents and purposes without giving up assets there, I think you've incrementally, I wouldn't say made the substantially, team better. but I think incrementally upgraded the forward group. Yeah. I think Hall's a big upgrade over Goudreau, but Hall needs a setup guy, and Monahan would have to be your setup guy there. I think. I like Nemesnikov, but I think that's an incremental upgrade on what we've got now. Yeah. So and, and I, basically, I just, with those, it would be like getting bodies to. It, it would be like say the tourists for Backland type thing, where you're cycling out one guy for a different one that basically does the same as the first one, but you can get more assets out of the first one. Yeah, like I just, I guess where I'm going with this is I don't think we need a rental. There's enough firepower on the free agent market. Now, whether these guys want to come to Calgary if we can't make the playoffs, another story. Um, I think Hall might, but the other guys might be tough without overpaying for them. And we know Tree's track record on July 1. But the option is there. I think if you're going to move an asset right now, you're moving it for futures of some kind. Yeah, and frankly, this team needs some more youth than injected in the lineup and almost all those guys i mentioned are under 30 yeah like 
one of the things that like I've been kind of frustrated with this team is that the veteran players they have are not exactly fleet of foot. And like that's fine under the old NHL, but like increasingly you're you're needing guys like you look at Matthew Nieto, who's a marginal fourth liner, but he wrecked the Flames last playoffs just because of the fact that he was able to outskate the Flames. And like the Flames just need a lot more youthful guys that have that foot speed. And I think that that will be one of the things that they need to improve on moving forward is getting some quick guys. And, like, to their credit, that they have been getting... You know, Dubé's fairly quick. Peltier's very quick. Phillips is quick. Like, they're getting high-end skill guys with speed. Well, it's just, and I, where we're at now, in order to put somebody on the roster, you've got to take somebody off the roster. So if you want Phillips or... I don't think Peltier is going to be ready next year, but if you no. have, say, Phillips or Godin, let's say those are your two, um, Glenn Godin or Matthew Phillips, who do you take out of the lineup? Right. And, and I yeah. think that's that's where we're at right now. I mean, you don't move if you move Goudreau, let's say you can move Backlund in the same summer. You free up one more spot. Um, but, you know, I think Reader you can definitely get rid of. But I mean, we just we don't have a lot of wiggle room right now. Yeah. And I wouldn't be opposed to Reader coming back either. No, on but, a, like but you've got to make deal. a decision there, right? Yeah. Would you rather have Reader or would you rather have Glenn Godden? Yeah. Uh, I, I think we're at that point where these guys, especially Godden, needs... I think you could probably justify leaving Phillips in the AHL for another year. I think that Godden needs to come up. Yeah. Well, especially Godden, I do believe, is 24 now. Well, that's, so. Yeah, that's why. He's getting older. Um, so, you know, we'll, we'll see who they move or who they don't move. But I think, as you mentioned, sort of the in-place... Um, the in-place rebuild, if you will. I think we might see some big pieces moved. We've changed coaches enough. We know coaches aren't the problem here. We we've, haven't changed the GM, but the GM, I think, is putting the right team on the ice on paper. The issue is no, somewhere in that dressing yeah. room. Well, like, the Flames went from being a really bad team to getting 107 points, and that was a team that Treleving assembled. So he, he did something right. When you look at this you team know. on paper, it's not a bad-looking team. No, like, frankly, in terms of overall depth, we're right up there with St. Louis and Colorado for, like, deepest in terms of raw talent in the West. It's just that every single player on the team is underperforming, and that's the problem. <laughs> You know, like if the if Gaudreau and Monahan and Lindholm were playing at their peak, like the Flames probably have 15 more points in the standings right now. It's just that they've been all playing like crap, frankly, for most of the se- not Lindholm so much, but Gaudreau and Monahan certainly have been, and it's one of those where you know you, you have to figure something out because like. It, you know you can't carry on with things as they are like and just you know like oh well we're content with making the playoffs and then getting embarrassed in the first round like you know you actually have to take steps forward to you know win games and you know actually try to vie for the Stanley Cup and especially with our division for the foreseeable future it looks like it's going to be a bad division for a long time because, like, you look at Edmonton, they're a tire fire with two, all you know, superstars. Vancouver has a, a few nice pieces, but they're kind of wishy-washy. Arizona's kind of bad. Can you see the Sharks being sellers this year? Yeah, I, I think they should. Uh, I think uh, if San Jose was smart, they'd sell anything that's not stapled down. But, you know, the they desperately need a rebuild. Uh, all of California is going to be bad for the foreseeable future. So, like, that's why it's frustrating with this team because, like, this is, like, prime opportunity to kick some butt. And yet they're waffling because of, you know, reasons. And <laughs> it's frustrating because, like, talent-wise, they should be tops in the division. But, yeah, effort level's not there and... 
at some point you have to say, well, this guy's talented, but he's just not working here, so why not you trade me your guy that's talented and, well, you know. Well, and the or... Flames have spent, a, you know, a number of years now building up this core. And I yeah. think there's probably the thought in internally, we don't want to disturb the core, but I think you've changed everything else you can. Like we said, the yeah. GM's put the right team on the ice. We've gone through how many coaches with a similar core. At this point, you got to say, you know what? The only other possible thing is there's an issue in the room. Yeah, well, you look at back in the 80s, the Flames, like in the early part of the 80s, the Flames were a fairly decent team when they got to Calgary and were for a number of years, but the, like, the goaltenders weren't good enough, and they couldn't beat Edmonton in the playoffs, and, like, they kept trying to find ways of nibbling around the edges to try and switch things up to get the team to the next level, and, like, it ended up that they ended up trading guys like Beers out for Mullen and, you know, getting Gilmore and, you know, swapping out viably good players for other viably good players, and eventually things clicked until, you know, as they were getting young guys that were up, like Neuendijk and Roberts and Fleury, and eventually things clicked. But you, this team, like, it seems like we're like the early 80s version of the Flames, where lots of good parts, but they're not the right parts to be successful where we are right now. And I think that you know, moving forward, this team might need to look at making a big, you know, player for player trade where, you know, one awesome player is going for another awesome player. And you could do that. And it would make sense to do that. It's just, and I think in the cap era that we're in, you're going to see more and more of that where teams have to trade guys of similar salary you know, because that's the only, unless you're going for UFAs, I think you're going to see more of those kind of hockey deals being made. Yeah. And, you know, like there are certain teams where they have players, like they perhaps have too much money tied up, like say Toronto. And, you know, you might be able to snag one of the, uh, their better players like Marner for, you know, less than you should. Or, you know, like there's plenty of options around the league where, like, especially if Toronto flounders and, like, gets another first-round exit, I think they'd be more receptive to changing things up. But, you know, it's it'll be interesting to see. Like, there are plenty of options out there, and I think that the Flames... Like, as long as the play, the play on the ice is what we've been seeing, where every game, is, you know, they should be winning and yet playing like crap, and they might get the two points, but not convincingly so then you have to put all the cards on the table and maybe start looking at swapping things out for, you know, and it's scary when you do that because, you know, you never know when, like, it might backfire and the other guy might tear off and the guy you get might suck. But, you know, I it's looking more and more like we're going to have to go in that direction of, you know, taking the risk of making a big deal. And... We'll see. Uh, it's frustrating to see because, like, this team is talented enough where they should be doing everything properly just on their own, but it's not working right now. Well, Matt, should we talk about the last week of, uh, or the second last week of games here, I guess, before the bye week? Sure. We've had some great trade discussion. Who knows what's going to happen, but I think this is just a scenario that there's a lot of options and we have to sit and wait and see what happens for the next month. Yeah. And especially with so many bad game teams that are coming up on the schedule, the flames could easily go on a tear and win a whole bunch. Well, not so... just that. I think there's a lot of other teams that their moves are going to influence our moves. Like you True. said, I think Defoli will be gone. I think Kreider will be gone. I think, you know, we almost want to wait for those to see what the trade market still looks like. Yeah. Well, let's look ahead to the next week. You and I made some predictions before the break. Um, I thought that we would win against Edmonton and Minnesota and lose to Vancouver, Chicago, and New York. Um, we ended up winning Chicago, Edmonton, losing Minnesota, New Montreal. So didn't quite get it the way I wanted to, and you thought we'd win all five. Yeah. You were a little more optimistic than I was. Yeah. Or sorry, and we, if they, we won Edmonton, it, New York, Minnesota. We lost Vancouver, Chicago. 
Yeah, if we had shown up in the first period of the Chicago and Vancouver game, I would have been right. But, you know, they didn't note the start time was 7 o'clock, and oh. <laughs> we should almost uh, change the clocks in the dressing room ahead by two hours. It's like, all right, boys, it's 9 o'clock. Let's get going. Yeah, they should have a little scoreboard in the dressing room that says, like, it's the start of the third period and we're down 4 nothing. <laughs> okay, boys, time to go. That's right. <laughs> We got this period and two overtimes to get it back. Let's go. Yeah. <laughs> well, Matt, we got uh, one, two, three, four games in the docket. We have a game on Tuesday. This will be the Chicago Blackhawks um, where we play in Chicago this time. Then the Flames come home for two games. They have Minnesota on Thursday and the Edmonton Oilers on Saturday. That, that'll be the second Battle of Alberta. And then on Monday, we're back on the road for the start of our Eastern Canadian road swing, a 5 p.m. start time versus the Montreal Canadien. Four games in the docket. What are you thinking? Uh, one win against Edmonton. That's it. So you think Edmonton, they win, and they lose all the games, Chicago, Minnesota, and Montreal. Yep. I was going to go some similar, but considering this team seems to be winning every other, they just won the uh, Minnesota game, so I think they're going to go every other. I think they'll lose the Chicago game. I think they'll win the Minnesota game, lose the Edmonton, and win the Montreal. So I'm going to say they win Minnesota-Montreal. Yeah. If they're, you're going based on quality of opponents, the Flames should go 4-0 this week. You know, but yeah. Effort levels matter, and, you know. Well, and they just they seem like they're every other, so let's go with that. Yep. And then that gives us two games after that um, the following week for uh, Toronto and Ottawa, and then we have our bye week. So we're coming up on the break fairly shortly here. Yep. Well, Matt, I think that covers everything for this week. Anything else Flames-wise you want to discuss? Not particularly. Uh, just hoping that this team gets – their act together sooner than later and you know we can have something more happy and optimistic to cheer about heading into the all-star break than oh let's blow the team up we got two all-stars <laughs> we can celebrate that yeah woo. <laughs> we can celebrate the fact that we should know the seattle team's name at the all-star game what what do you expect um all of mine, all the ones I would like to see, let's say, aren't on the list. I think they should have the, embrace their, their uh, coffee culture and be the Seattle Grinders. I think the Seattle Starbucks would be a good name, playing live out of the Amazon Prime Arena. We promise we'll ship them overnight to their away destinations. <laughs> um, of the names that they've put out there, I think they'll probably end up being, I think the Cougars is one of them. Yeah. Though it's it'd be similar to the Panthers. I think it'll either be the Cougars or the Kraken. Yeah. I still like the idea of either the Seattle Battle Cattle or uh, the Rain City Bitch Pigeons. But Well, if you look you know, at the names that they actually trademarked, right? You're, you yeah. can probably, like, both the Cougars and the, uh, bo both the Cougars are in there um, and the Kraken are in there. I can't see them in the Metropolis or whatever it was because they have a Metropolis, a Metropolitan Division. So that would get really confusing. Yeah. And weren't they the millionaires back in the day? Yeah, I also don't know what you do for a logo there. I have some guy making it rain. Like, I don't know if that's that's really what you – a modern NHL team name. Yeah. It's like you would never see a team called the Maroons in 2020. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be a little weird. So, we'll, we'll see what happens there, but there's some things we can celebrate during the All-Star Week. Yeah. All right, Matt, we'll enjoy these games, and uh, let's hope we do better than every other. Yep. As always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.